Hello everyone, my name is Maxim Fatih. I am presenting from Bellevue, Washington. I'm originally from Russia where I studied uh, physics and later I received my computer science degree from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, today I'm going to talk about temporal. Um, I want to give you some history um, to kind of give you idea that it's not the uh, project which we can, uh, came up with overnight. It uh, took probably like at least 15 years to get where we are. So um, I was tech lead uh, of the Amazon messaging platform when Amazon was transitioning to microservices. And I, I was uh, later that the engine used for uh, the uh, Amazon messaging platform was used by the simple queue service uh, when AWS uh, appeared. Um, I also was tech lead for the simple workflow service, uh, which is kind of, uh, was the, which pioneered a lot of ideas that uh, we are right now developing as part of Temporal. Uh, my co-founder uh, of the Temporal Samar worked with me on a simple workflow, but uh, later he came to Microsoft and uh, he was tech lead of the service bus, uh, Azure service bus. But as a side project, he wanted to uh, bring uh, to the people the same ideas of the simple workflow. So he developed durable task framework, uh, which later uh, became so popular that Azure Functions team adopted that. And uh, uh, now uh, you, uh, you can use it as Azure durable functions. Uh, later, we both joined uh, Uber, and there we built uh, two open source projects. One was Sheremy, uh, which was a messaging system, and later Cadence, uh, which was a re implementation of the simple workflow ideas using completely different software stack and uh, as an open source project. Uh, when Cadence became very popular, not only inside of Uber, where hundreds, uh, over 100 use cases were running on that uh, within three years, but also outside, uh, we uh, quit Uber and started our own company called Temporal uh, and forked the uh, Cadence project as Temporal as an open source project. I was told that uh, if you kind of present in some technology, you have to give some social proof and uh, here's kind of some of it. Uh, so these are early adopters of our technology and uh, there are many more companies using that in production, but uh, these are companies which went public about their usage. Uh, I gave presentation into uh, at a um, multiple presentation. If you Google my name, uh, you will uh, see a lot of videos about which present uh, cadence and uh, later temporal uh, and their programming model. But today I want to talk about the backend, about the how cluster is organized and why we have all these multiple roles of the cluster uh, in our architecture. And I don't expect you to understand uh, that uh, picture right now, but I'm pretty sure by the end of the presentation you will be able to make more sense out of it. Uh, but let's start from the beginning. What is a workflow? And uh, people have different definitions. There are like uh, even uh, standards and so on. Uh, my definition is that workflow is just a resilient program. Uh, and resilient, what it means that this program will continue execution uh, independently of uh, like in presence of failures. And uh, you can have de new deployments, you can have uh, uh, just uh, infrastructure outages, uh, that is uh, like availability zones going down and you want your program continue execution. Usually the, this program is organized as a, like a sequence of tasks and then uh, it also has to react to external events and deal with time because uh, time is important, a component of every business level pro process and timeouts. I'm not going to spend time, as I said, uh, a lot on the programming model as I presented that multiple times. But if you never thought about temporal or cadence, uh, here's the kind of basic idea. Basic idea that you just write code, here's Java sample. We also support Go and PHP SDK <coughs> and working on other SDKs in the future. Uh, at least TypeScript and Python will be probably de uh, developed this year. Uh, and um, this looks like normal Java code. The diff uh, why is it a workflow? It is a workflow because uh, full state of this program uh, is fully preserved all the time, it's fully durable. So it means that if your uh, program restarts or even backend service goes down and then back, uh, your program will be in exactly the same state with all local variables, threads, um, and uh, stack traces in exactly the same state. That's why you can go and uh, write code we just uh, call sleep, block and sleep for 30 days, and then uh, unblock and do something after that. Uh, and if you, you don't need to care about process restarts and deal with databases and recovery of the state because it's all done automatically by the temporal. And again, as I said, I'm not going to spend more time on this. If you're interested, watch my past presentation or just visit temporal.io and uh, go through our tutorials. 
so on a high level, any workflow engine, and again, it's not necessarily one which uses workflow as code, but also engines which use YAML, JSON, or XML, if you like those languages, uh, they are kind of state machines. So practically, workflow is a state machine which defines in which order to run tasks and also react to external event if necessary. And if you represent this state machine, uh, kind of what workflow definition does as a sequence diagram, we can practically say it asks tasks to execute in certain order. Uh, but uh, if you want to implement the uh, workflow engine, we need to have, this was like more logical uh, representation, uh, but a physical representation will be some sort of code, some engine which will drive those workflows. So the way it's usually done is uh, that you will go to workflow definition, uh, the state machine, give it the state of the world and say, what are the next uh, tasks, commands to run? And the command can be run task one. So it will go and run command uh, task one. Then it will notify workflow definition that task one is completed. It will uh, execute the state machine logic according to its definition and say, okay, now you need to run task two. In practical systems, you don't want to call tasks directly because uh, these workers can be uh, somewhere else and they might be not available, which run those tasks and processes. Uh, they uh, can be issues with flow control because uh, just you don't you don't you uh, and um, then can be unavailable for some time. So you or if they can can be slow. So you want to fit tasks in appropriate order. So using queues to dispatch tasks to uh, the implementation is a very common technique. So uh, you practically uh, every almost every practical workflow engine uses queues to dispatch uh, tasks to workers uh, like uh, worker processes which host those tasks. And temporal at least uh, we also run workflow code outside of the. Uh, core engine. So we also use tasks uh, and queues to deliver uh, the request to workflow definition and then uh, uh, get commands back what to be executed. So uh, practically all communication to workflow definition and uh, task implementation is done for queuing. As I mentioned, the time is important because every task invocation should have a timeout. Uh, workflow itself can have a timeout and uh, then we need to be able to execute operations like sleep 30 days. So we need some external uh, timer service or timer queue, uh, which will uh, durably store those timers and then dispatch those timers. Uh, so workflow engine needs to have not only task queues, but also timer queues or timer uh, engine uh, and uh, add tasks there every time some state transition happens. And then we also need to store state of the workflow itself. So every time we start a workflow, uh, every update, uh, practically we need to at least to create state in the state database, then we need to create a timer and then we need to put task uh, for the task queue for the workflow definition to pick up. And uh, when workflow definition decides, gives a list of commands, we again need to update uh, and create uh, tasks and update the state. Uh, what's important uh, to understand, uh, and I think this is like a very important part of this presentation, is unless these updates across these multiple data sources are transactional, uh, this engine is not very practical. You don't want to run on top of the engine uh, which doesn't have transactions across all these components because you will run in all sorts of race conditions. It's almost impossible to get rid of race conditions because if you update state and then uh, uh, try to put task in a task queue, if update goes through and then uh, uh, update to task queue fails, so you will end up in a state which thinks there is a task outstanding but task is not. If you put task in the task queue first and then you update the state, if update is slow, task can be delivered and processed by the time update went, uh, like is, is, is going through, so it will be inconsistent and it needs to deal with all these edge cases. Uh, so uh, if updates to all these components is, are transactional, then uh, all these race conditions just disappear. Uh, your system becomes much simpler and the application level code uh, doesn't see all these edge cases and it's actually simplified the programming model. Um, but it's not only applies to the state machine, uh, to the uh, workflow engine implementations. The reality is that uh, in these days, majority of the uh, engineers don't use workflow like orchestrator or like workflow engines uh, to write their um, services. What they do, they use queues, they use databases, they use other data sources. They create these hedgepodge architectures of like uh, different components, and there are no transactions across them usually. And the uh, point is that uh, the like what I said about not having transactions, all this race condition applies to majority of the system, ad hoc system built by developers. And I think this is important, very important to understand that this is uh, if you're building system from these components, you, you're guaranteed to have edge cases and race conditions. 
Um, so that's why having like a robust engine like temporal underlying your architecture will simplify your life tremendously. So if you want to remember one slide for the presentation, remember this one, that uh, workflow engines are hard, not because, uh, like mostly because they, they need to deal with multiple things like skewing, uh, timers, and state, and updates across them should be transactional. So when you implement a workflow engine, uh, because of all the, these transactionality requirements, majority of existing implementations just use one database and even one process. And then, yes, if you have one database and one process, uh, trans transactional requirements are easily solvable and you can provide pretty uh, robust engine. Obviously, this engine wouldn't be scalable because it will be limited to a single process to, or a single database. So if you want a, a scalable solution, first we need to decide what are the scale, uh, di uh, scale, uh, dimensions of scalability. Obviously, uh, one dimension would be creating these uh, huge workflows and have a single workflow which spawns um, multiple machines. Uh, for example, MapReduce is a technology which allows to write single kind of MapReduce pipeline, and this pipeline will be executed by thousands of machines. Uh, and you can think of this, this pipeline being more as, a, as a single workflow. Uh, for the use cases which we, we are targeting, we uh, actually decided to go with uh, approach when we're not going to scale up a single workflow uh, instance. We, we, you cannot have single workflow which runs million uh, tasks. Uh, every workflow should be limited in size, but then we can infinitely scale out the number of workflows. So you can, if you need to run a million tasks, you probably will have single workflow instance which will uh, create thousand children. Each of the children can run thousand tasks. So you get your million tasks, but uh, each of the instances will be bounded. So as soon as you say that uh, workflow, uh, each workflow instance is, is, uh, limit, is of limited size, you can go and start uh, distributing them across multiple machines. Uh, and uh, so scaling out a uh, fleet of machines becomes practical because each, each instance is uh, guaranteed to fit in, within a single machine. Obviously, if you want to uh, have a very, very large system, you need to scale out the database as well. So uh, having a single database instance will, will, will be a bottleneck. So if you have a par uh, partitioned database and you have partitioned uh, uh, hosts which kind of maintain the state and perform all the operations and the workflows, you can get to very high. Uh, uh, scalable solution. But uh, as I said, uh, we need to maintain transactionality. And as soon as you start breaking uh, your persistence into multiple databases, you wouldn't be able to, unless you start doing uh, complex things like two-phase commits and so on, uh, across multiple databases, you wouldn't be able to provide transactional guarantees. So uh, the kind of simple way to solve that would be to have one database per host. Right. So if you have four hosts, we can distribute uh, these work workflows across those hosts, and every host will have its own database, which contains uh, like its own queues, its own timers, uh, uh, and so on, uh, and uh, workflow state. And this way, uh, we can guarantee transactions within each uh, host and we, within each database, and uh, that would be pretty straightforward system to implement. Uh, that system wouldn't be very practical because uh, it would be very hard to add and remove hosts, and I'm not going to spend much time on that. Uh, the standard way to solve this is just using sharding. So instead of physical hosts, we use partitions within the database and, and uh, we kind of over allocate number of partitions. Then we can uh, move those, uh, then we allocate those partitions to specific physical hosts and we can move them around if necessary. And the same applies to shards within our uh, hosts. So you can uh, um, hash workflows to specific shard ID and then uh, use consistent hashing to uh, uh, put a uh, to to uh, allocate shard to a specific host, uh, but to implement that you need to know me membership of your cluster because if you, if you need to allocate shards to host, you need to know which hosts are available in your cluster. So as soon as you do that, you need some mechanism for uh, for uh, membership, and then you need routing layer because if request comes in and usually you don't want to have fat client side library which understands topology of your cluster. So you need to have uh, front ends which will uh, know the membership of the cluster and route uh, requests to specific, uh, for, for example, workflow ID 1 or workflow ID 2. It will know in which shard it, it allocated and it belongs to and then uh, where the shard runs right now uh, at, at which host. The sh sh sharding by workflow ID works. Uh, problem is that it doesn't work very well for, ta uh, for, task, in, uh, for task use. For example, if we have activities which listen on the uh, task queue named foo, uh, how do you get uh, activity tasks waiting to be executed? If we, uh, we store those activity tasks in every shard, 
you probably will need to go to all shards and ask them, do you have anything for foo on task queue, uh, task queue foo? Uh, as we want to allocate a large number of shards because we want to spot very large scale and we will over allocate them, uh, these uh, type of queries become impractical. Even if you have then, um, like you cannot even aggregate them over host because uh, each shard practically requires a separate database query. Imagine you have 10,000 shards, so every time you do poll, you will need to go and like uh, fan out for 10,000 10, uh, database requests. So a practical solution is to move Q into a separate component with its own uh, persistence. And uh, that solves the problem of routing because you know where to which host to route and which host uh, uh, right now owns that Q, and you can have its own database with its own persistence for that. But uh, it obviously introduces other problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that we lose transactionality. As soon as queues live outside of uh, core shards of uh, workflow state, uh, we don't have transactions across them anymore. And we uh, will have the race conditions which I described earlier. Obviously, one way to solve that would be uh, to um, use uh, some sort of uh, two-phase commit uh, variant, uh, Paxos or um, Raft and so on. But it would introduce pretty uh, significant complexity to the system. And uh, also require us uh, participate like every component of that interaction uh, to implement pretty complex protocols. Uh, the way we solved it in Temporal is that uh, we don't use uh, any uh, of those uh, transactions. We just rely on database. How do we do that? We use uh, so-called transfer queues. Uh, the idea is that every shard which stores workflow state also uh, stores uh, a queue. So we will have, uh, if you have 10,000 shards, we'll have 10,000 queues. And every time we make update to the shard, we also can update that queue transaction because it lives in the same partition. So if we need to start workflow, we will create a state for the workflow and we need to create workflow task uh, for the worker to pick up. Uh, we will add uh, the task to the local queue to the, that shard. And then uh, this will be committed to the database atomically. And then we will have a thread which will pull from that queue and then practically transfer that message to this uh, queue in subsystem. And this way, uh, we, we have transactional commit. And then we can later uh, transfer that to the queue in subsystem. Obviously, this uh, transfer can fail. We will retry, so it can, can create duplicates. But we have separate part of the system which will do the dupe in there. Um, so, so that, that is kind of a very simple mechanism, but it allows us to uh, have transactionality at the same time don't rely on complex two-phase commit protocols. Other requirement that uh, workflows, any reasonable workflow system should implement is ability to list workflows, right? Because you want to go and say, give me all workflows started by this user in the last 24 hours, all workflows which failed, and so on. Uh, going again to all shards and 10,000 shards and asking them for, inf uh, even if they have index, each of them has its index, for that information would be impractical. Uh, so the way to solve that is to have a separate indexing component. We use Elasticsearch. Uh, there is no, it can, any, any indexing technology could be used instead. Uh, there is nothing special about Elastic, that, uh, but it's something which we just decided to use because it was open source. Uh, and we use the same uh, tra uh, tra transfer queue approach to transfer uh, to commit uh, so-called visibility records into the H chart and then uh, use transfer queue to transfer them to the Elastic. Uh, this uh, mechanism uh, has an inherent delay. So Elastic uh, index is always a few seconds, maybe like uh, at least some time behind the actual update. So it's not, it's kind of uh, converges to the correct uh, this delay, but it's not, uh, um, atomically updated uh, uh, with uh, uh, when we commit message uh, to, to the core core to core shard uh, partition, but there is a guarantee that uh, if a commit happened, that Elastic will be updated, and uh, if uh, it cannot be it cannot happen that you will update the state and Elastic wouldn't be updated because of the transfer queue mechanism. As soon as you can list workflows, you, uh, you, your users will ask you to uh, perform batch operations. For example, I want to terminate all workflows which match this criteria, started by this user. And uh, you can program that from outside, just to make a list, get the IDs, save them to the file, and then execute some script to terminate them. But to execute that reliably, this is actually sounds like a workflow. And this is exactly what Temporal is doing. It implements this uh, logic uh, using a workflow and, but this workflow is built into the core cluster, so it's kind of system workflow 
uh, use it, uh, and it's implemented as normal workflow. It can, could be implemented outside, but we decided to implement it inside because we want this kind of functionality to be provided as part of the core uh, cluster functionality. So we have this worker role which performs system workflows like database scans and other like operations which can take long time reliably uh, using standard uh, temporal abstra uh, workflow abstractions. I showed this slide uh, at the beginning of the presentation and I, I didn't expect you to make sense out of that. But now I think you can uh, understand why we have all these roles. So we have, have so-called history component, uh, which uh, is responsible for state transitions of individual workflows, has transfer queues to be able to transactionally update, uh, update uh, create tasks. And uh, then we have a uh, matching component, which is responsible for uh, delivering uh, ta tasks to uh, like for queuing and matching uh, pull requests coming from uh, external workers to add task requests. And then we have front end because we need routing. We have Elastic because we have uh, indexing and we have worker component to implement background jobs. And then we have workflows and activities which are implemented by uh, application developers using uh, temporal SDKs. This architecture is uh, pretty uh, scalable and reliable because every single host uh, in this uh, architecture can fail and it still will continue functioning. You can, uh, because shards and history and service and matching will be redistributed automatically. We use cluster database like Cassandra, which can sustain uh, node failures. Elastic is also is fault tolerant, but, um, and front ends are stateless, so you can add and remove them anytime as well. But this system still has uh, single points of failure in terms of like blast radios because for the single bad schema deployment to the database can bring it down, the update of the front end with a bug and so on. So if you want to provide very high availability, uh, we have multi-cluster deployment. In this case, we have a synchronous replication on the application level and uh, even the total meltdown of the cluster or even like for the Amazon region, um, unavailability of region will not stop your workflows because you would be able to fill over your uh, execution to another cluster and continue execution. Uh, this is for the next talk. I have uh, it's pretty complex uh, part of the system. Uh, the the whole uh, multi cluster cl cluster setup. Uh, I can make multiple multiple uh, conference talk about that as well. Just to recap, uh, Temporal uh, is a uh, technology, uh, besides this uh, awesome programming model of writing uh, distributed code, uh, like a reliable code for uh, using a programming language, it's uh, highly scalable and it scales the number of workflow execution and it's consistent, uh, which is very important to avoid all sorts of race conditions and it allows to run uh, pluggable uh, activities and even workflow implementations outside of the cluster, which uh, allows very, very high uh, like flexibility, right? You can practically write uh, your workflows and activities in any language. Uh, in the future, I'm pretty sure practically any language. This concludes my presentation. Uh, I want to mention that um, we are actively hiring and uh, you can reach our project on uh, over Temporal.io or directly on GitHub. We also have community forums so, for support and you can reach me or our company on Twitter. Thank you.